Some of this will be about optics because Bowie understood the gravity of being in the moment and feeling it. And again, we've got some photographic evidence of last time. So optics were significant last time. Yes. This, and this being the, uh, the first the, project that I you... How talented you are. <laughs> we also have some video footage of, cool. uh, of the song Fame. Uh, awesome. So we are in a tapestry at the moment of you a year ago. So even back when it was at the Parkway, we can see the the use of the screen there. We've got yeah. the three, two, one. Yeah. Like, yeah, then, man. Then we're, then we're into it. So you're wearing a black waistcoat and a white shirt for this number. Uh, of course, you're changing for different numbers. What's the significance of what you're wearing for, for this one? Well, you know, I just, with with each, like, act yes. I felt like there was at least I was attempting to kind of weave an energy and some of this becomes like um, maybe amalgam is not the right word but you kind of get an idea what his energy was through the nine inch nails period right or whatever yeah. so then there's the um, editorial look and, and frankly we have a great seamstress and a great stylist, right? So you have some of these discussions. This yeah. is part of the pre-pro that goes into doing a good show. You want to talk to the people who are going to suit you up and send you out there about how they feel about this, you know, what do you feel about Bowie's style and, and, and all the incarnations mm. of it. Mm -hmm. And so what you do is you, so you kind of fuse some of these things together. And for me, it was just like, okay, this is what I'm thinking when I'm thinking about him is like David Bowie, the combat boot wearing, you know, British flag coat having. Yep. And this is what I think about Boy when he's in his editorial high fashion look, right? And yep. I, again, am not him. So it's just about not being literal with, with wardrobe as much as taking the impact of his style and... You know, doing it your way. Yeah, I feel like I'm a stylish enough fella. I want to make it happen for myself <laughs> just, just because if I tried to do yeah. him, it'd yeah. be disastrous. Okay, so that was something else that came up when I was talking with a fragment of the local musicians who were influenced by Bowie. Orion Treon from Phantom Tales and mm -hmm. Extraterrestrials was saying that the lesson of a life like Bowie's is to do it your own way. Yeah. And yeah, Kieran, Kieran Daly from uh, The Stress of Her Regard was highlighting that when he first heard Heroes, like he wanted to sound just like that. Mm -hmm. And then he kept on trying and he couldn't do it, which was great. And then he yeah. ended up sounding like himself. It's so essentially the to... boy Little Richard story. You know, he wanted to be Little Richard, but you know, that's that. I mean, that's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> and and he, once he realized it, see, but that's where the cool is at. Right. This is the mistake that I think a lot of artists don't get. The cool is there, right? You just have to freaking unearth it. Your cool it's, is there. Yeah, your cool is there. I mean, and it's, Frankly, it stays with you even when you get old. It, old cool dudes are still cool dudes. Cool they don't know that. how not to be, right? Yeah. David Bowie knew where his cool button was, and he was all around it. And he wasn't at yeah. all threatened by somebody else's notion about what cool was. And that's where that's those are the coolest mugs. Of course, you know. And to rein it once your your cool is considered by a particular audience to be X, to be like Ziggy Stardust. So yeah. Then <laughs> throw the now audience. That's going to make some people <laughs> scratch their heads and stuff. Yeah. But no, it's bravery, man. But, you know, there's a local artist, and I don't mean to, to extrapolate this over to, to local artists, but I, like I think of this music. guy a little bit in this fashion. And, and, and he's going to be doing the show with us, Jeremy Ilvesacker. Oh, yes. To me, Jeremy Ilvesacker yeah. is like the coolest dude out there. He is. And there's a couple yeah. reasons for that. Jeremy, there's a couple reasons why I feel that way. Jeremy came into Greasy Meal when John Fields went to L.A. Yes. To kind of buoy us for a while. He went on tour with us for a while. And here's a guy who could have very easily come in and just played the bag. Right. And been safe. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But instead, I felt like we morphed in ways around Jeremy because he was just so different in his approach to music than John. John was about rhythm and wah-wah, and John's rhythm is just off the charts because he plays bass, and he's just such yeah. a, you know. Jeremy is a brilliant guitar player <laughs> who understands <laughs> atmosphere and, and theatrics. Yes. Right? And he, I could feel it impacting me. You know, I was like, wow, you know. I, and so... When you see him, he's always, he's like the coolest dude in the room. He seems a little bit self-effacing, but I, you know, you don't know if he loves you or hates you. But I just, 
think I love artists like that, and and he's just a joy to to work around. So to be able to do these Bowie shows with him, yes, it's just awesome. We know that we love him. Don't we? Yes, <laughs> we can love us and Elvis, <laughs> man. I do though. Two, Seriously, just two of the bands that he's in are, of course, Alpha Consumer mm-hmm. and Grammar's Boyfriend. <laughs> he's in and the Suburbs. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. There's, a, there's that other one, but you can't not but yeah, the you get it. You get it. <laughs> So um, let's. So when did? He, what was the year? Can you remember when he joined Greasy Meal? Jeepers! Um, <clears throat> I want to say ninety six, ninety eight ish. Okay, and so I got no you, sense of time. So how why you, you asking me this question, <laughs> man? I'll re, I'll research. Whatever you can just. Okay. It's, it's in there. If you say ninety six, ninety eight, <laughs> then the, the correct one will I be like the, it. there. You go. <laughs> Uh, okay, so he joined in 96, he joined in 98. Did you reach out to him? I honestly don't also? remember the process, but I, I, I want to believe this was a James Anton production. I mean, mm-hmm. James was sort of the muscle. Mm. <laughs> I mean, he's the man, you know what I mean? So I think he and Jeremy were, were hanging back then and he recommended Jeremy and it was just a no-brainer. I mean, if Jim recommended something, generally speaking, it was just going to happen. Yeah. I didn't know a lot about Jeremy. I didn't, and frankly, at first, I didn't completely get it. I didn't get it. So what I did was, you feel, did we, was it Alpha Consumer that you were listening to initially? No, I mean, I just wanted to hear him. I just wanted to experience him live. I wanted to see yeah. what it was like in that moment, the most moment of truth. And I didn't really get that until he was playing with us. And right. then it was, then you're curious about everything he does, but... Yeah. You know, how was he going to be in that? I mean, that wasn't, Greasy Meal wasn't like a organism, you know. How was he going to function in that? And I think everybody had some anxiety about that, but but not him. Yeah, he can adapt. So what he's, he does in the as, suburbs as adaptable is totally as any different. musician, yeah. Yeah, of course. So he's, he's remarkable, but that's humility. And so when people are committed to making a cause and experience all that it can be, it requires you, like, going in that way.